In this video, we will talk about the changes that occur in the embryo during second week of development. Hello, I'm Dr. Azaz from MedicoVisual.com. Welcome to this visual lecture. At the end of first week of development after fertilization, the embryo is partially embedded into the endometrium of his or her mother. And you can see the trophoblast, it has two layers by now. The one layer that does not have a clear cut cellular demarcation or cellular boundaries and it consists of it is a single mass consisting of lots of nuclei interspersed between them. It is called syncytiotrophoblast because it acts as a syncytium, it, it acts as a single structure. While the other layer of trophoblast that has clear cut cell membranes in between the cell, clear cut cellular boundaries is there. That layer, that type of trophoblast is called cytotrophoblast. So basically trophoblast has now two layers and along with that we have inner cell mass or embryo proper that will form the actual embryo and then there is this blastocyst cavity or blastocele is there right so this was this is the structure of embryo or blastocyst at the end of first week now there are some changes that are occurring uh, in the with the with this trophoblast and then there are some changes that occur within this inner cell mass or embryo proper First, let's describe the changes that occur with a syncytio and cytotrophoblast, mainly syncytiotrophoblast because they are easier to describe. And then we will focus our attention towards the development of inner cell mass. Right? So let's blur this area and only focus here. So initially, as you can see in this diagram, that syncytiotrophoblast is initially present mainly on the uh, embryonic pole this is the embryonic pole and the embryo it is partially embedded into the endometrium and it completes this implantation process and it is fully embedded into the endometrium by day 10 now as this syncytiotrophoblast will continue to erode this endometrial tissue the embryo will continue to burrow deep inside deep inside the endometrium and now the syncytiotrophoblast it will surround the embryo from all sides. It is now not just lying above the embryonic pole, but it is surrounding the embryo from all sides. But remember, there, there will be still very little syncytiotrophoblast at ab embryonic pole. Now, the point from the point where the embryo entered into the endometrium, there was a surface defect which is now filled by deposition of fibrin network, and this is called fibrin coagulum. And because of presence of embryo inside the endometrium, there will be slight bulge. There will be slight bulge of endometrium into the and into the uterine cavity, into the cavity of uterus. And of course, as it will grow bigger, the, the bulge, it will become more prominent. Now the embryo is growing further and since trophoblast, it will also proliferate and grow further. Then what happens that small spaces appear in between the since trophoblast. These spaces are named as lacunae. Now oh, these lacunae, these are not isolated spaces, but they are interconnected network of spaces. If you can go deeper, they inside this, they may be connected, this lacunae may be connected with this lacunae, and then it may be connected with this, and so on. There will be a complete, these are not, remember, these are not isolated spaces. This is a basically interconnected network of lacunae and this, this stage of development of the trophoblast or embryo as a whole, it is called lacunar stage of development and it is occurring during second week of development. And by the way, this formation of lacunar network, it gives a sponge-like appearance to the syncytiotrophoblast. 
Now, of course, as the sensitive trophoblast was growing and eroding the maternal tissue, it end up eroding maternal blood vessels as well, maternal endometrial blood vessels. And let's suppose here it eroded a, an arteriole, a maternal endometrial arteriole. And high pressure blood from this arteriole, it may start flowing into this lacunae and of course as i have told you these lacunae they are interconnected so this high pressure blood from this lacunae it will flow into all other lacunae due to interspersed network of lacunae and ultimately here let's suppose this sensitive of trophoblast it here it may have eroded some maternal venule so here the blood will go out so what will happen that arteriolar blood it will bath the lacunal network and ultimately this blood will be drained into the into the maternal endometrial venule so a special type of circulation has been established that maternal blood is coming bathing this uh, this uh, sensitive trophoblast and giving nutrition to the embryo and taking up waste material and ultimately this less oxygenated blood will flow outward into the venule so this is what we call that there is formation of primitive utero-placental circulation although there is no placenta that has been formed up till now and that is why it is primitive utero-placental circulation it is not definitive utero-placental circulation later on we will see how this uh, embryo properly forms and how definitive utero-placental circulation starts clear finally during this stage what happens that from this uh, cytotrophoblast finger-like projections or finger-like processes that arise and they go into the into this syncytiotrophoblast and these finger-like processes these are called primary villi we will discuss its significance in later lectures right and finally something interesting happens during uh, about somewhere between 10 to 12 or even 14 days uh, when women she was expecting her menstruation her period but of course she will not experience the period because she is right now pregnant right but high pressure flow of blood into this lacunar network from this high pressure blood some drops of blood it may seep through this lacunar network come out into the uterine cavity through this defect and it may come outside the body through the vagina from the vagina it may come outside and due to this flow of some blood the women she will feel that she is menstruating she is menstruating abnormally low but she is menstruating and this may lead to miscalculation of estimated date of delivery of the baby and this is basically called implantation bleeding so let's review what is happening with the trophoblast during second week of development initially the that sensitive trophoblast it is lying only above the embryonic pole but as it grow further the embryo from all side it is surrounded by sensitive trophoblast then lacunae are formed in the within the sensitive trophoblast and utero-placental circulation starts and finally the primary villi are formed by the cytotrophoblast so these are just the changes that occur in the trophoblast during second week of development now let's focus our attention towards the inner cell mass or embryo proper right now this initially this inner cell mass it is basically an amalgam of two types of cell it is a mixture of two types of cell and these two types of cell they are not arranged in a particular fashion but as the second week start and even sometime before the second week at the end of first week what happens that these cell will rearrange themselves within this inner cell mass <coughs> the cells that will come to lie above or top these cells that come to lie above or up or top they are called 
a pee blast a pee blast <laughs> well not really a pee blast they are a pee blast i am calling a pee blast so that you know that they are lying up or above right and well precisely speaking they are not lying up they are lying dorsal to the or behind the what is this epiblast uh, the other cells hypoblast right now the other cells these yellow cells they are called hypoblast hypo means less so basically they are less in size i mean small in size they are low cuboidal and they are low lying the other cells epiblast they are high lying and they are large uh, they are longer they are they are tall columnar so two types of cells that are formed here that are established here tall columnar epiblast and low cuboidal hypoblast now these hypoblast they are lying dorsally or above the blastocyst cavity right they are lying posterior to or dorsal to the blastocyst cavity by the way you know this this side this pole this pole of the embryo is basically this will become the back of embryo so th this is dorsal side if you are <coughs> confused about this terminology please watch part first of embryology series of medico visual i will give the link in description basically this side of embryo is dorsal side and this side is ventral side of the embryo so on ventral side there is hypoblast and on the dorsal side there are epiblasts that are lying now hypoblasts they are lying dorsal to blastocyst cavity now what these hypoblasts will do is that these hypoblasts will proliferate and they will line this blastocyst cavity what they will do is that they will customize they will personalize this blastocyst cavity by decorating its wall by their own cells right initially this blastocyst cavity it was lined by what is this cytotrophoblast but now this blastocyst cavity will be lined by what is this hypoblast derived cells and now this blastocyst cavity at, as it is lined by hypoblast derived cells now it is named as not blastocyst cavity but now it is called exosilomic cavity you know what is the meaning of silom silom in body cavity the real actual body cavity of the embryo will will be inside this embryo proper but this body cavity this is not body cavity this is outside the body cavity of embryo so that is why this cavity is not silomic cavity this is exo exo mean outside this is exo silomic cavity are you clear about its naming scheme right so this is exo silomic cavity and by the way these hypoblast derived cells initially as they came here they were low cuboidal cells but they differentiated into squamous or flattened cells now they are not low cuboidal but they are squamous cells and with that reference the name of this membrane the main, the name of this wall of this exosilomic cavity is simply exosilomic membrane it has got an other name that is husserl's membrane and this name is in the honor of dr chester huser this name is in the honor of dr chester h huser who was an american embryologist who first described this membrane right so this cavity is exosilomic cavity and the membrane is exosilomic membrane or huser's membrane clear now let me tell you something interesting about this exosilomic cavity you know what the birds embryos they do not have luxury to grow within the uh, uterus of their mother within the endometrium of their mother so they have to grow inside those special eggs and as you know eggs uh, they have egg yolk why they have egg yolk because the mammalian embryo it gets nutrition from the endometrium of mother 
but because the bird's embryo they do not grow inside the endometrium so they get their nutrition from the egg yolk now the structure a structure analogous to exosomic cavity forms within the bird's embryo and this structure it surrounds and it lines the egg yolk right exosomic cavity like structure forms in the bird's embryo and it surrounds and lines the egg yolk i am talking about bird's embryo so with that reference even the human's uh, exosomic cavity has got another name and that is yolk sac even though there is no yolk here there is no yolk in the exosomic cavity of human embryo but still it is called yolk sac i think embryologists are quite conventional people i don't know why they have put this name yolk sac even though there is no yolk maybe due to resemblance with the structure of yolk sac of the bird's embryo right so conventionally they call it yolk sac well truly speaking even in the human embryo this yolk sac has a role in provision of nutrients to the embryo during early stages this yolk sac or exosomic cavity it truly provides nutrition to the embryo so this yolk sac name is somehow justified right now this yolk sac it is early yolk sac later on there will be some change in this yolk sac and th that definitive yolk sac will be formed so at this stage this yolk sac is not definitive yolk sac it is early yolk sac or primitive yolk sac or primary yolk sac right and then there are some embryologists and some people who are like me by the way i am not embryologist i am just a medical teacher so by the way there are some people that are like me who do not like to stick themselves with the conventions or traditions so they like to call this cavity as umbilical vesicle or umbilical vesicle why are they call umbilical vesicle or primary or primitive or early umbilical vesicle the reason is that truly this umbilical vesicle later on it gets incorporated into the umbilical cord of the baby and with that reference this uh, exosomic membrane or husserl membrane it has also got several other names that is yolk sac membrane or yolk sac endoderm and similarly umbilical vesicle membrane or umbilical vesicle endoderm why endoderm why we are calling it endoderm we will discuss that later but this is what it is and what i want to put in your mind what i want to imprint in your mind clearly that there are several names of this cavity in some books you will read you will read that there is written exosomic cavity somewhere you will see written yolk sac somewhere you will see primary yolk sac somewhere you will see primitive yolk sac and other times you read early yolk sac and primary umbilical vesicle and so on and so forth but remember never ever get confused all these names point towards a single structure this structure that is lined by hypoblast and hypoblast derived flattened cells so please my friends don't get confused with the naming scheme i think after this pandemic ends i am going to throw a party for this embryologist i am going to call them on a party and i am going to ask them why don't you come up with a naming consensus you are confusing medical students for years <laughs> i think my anger is justified that's what they are doing now as these hypoblasts they have got their own personalized cavity their elder brothers these epiblasts they will insist that they want to get their own cavity right so these cells in the middle these epiblasts in the center they will start dying they will start undergo apoptosis and new cavity will be formed right you know some people they die for their country some people die for for their religion and here these people are dying for a cavity <laughs> well except that they are not people they are 
epiblast cells <laughs> so they have got their own cavity and within this cavity these uh, these cells they will throw osmotically active substances and due to these osmotically active substances ultra through ultra filtration of maternal tissue some fluid will seep inside this right so it will contain a special fluid now fortunately this cavity has got not many names a single name of this cavity is a single name of this cavity is amniotic cavity and the cells that line this cavity they are called amnioblast and this is simply amnioblast membrane right so not some fancy name it is not called uh, azazian's membrane of course why would they call it an azazian's membrane i have not described it for the first time <laughs> right so it is amnioblast that are lining this amniotic cavity and amnioblast they are thought to be derived by epiblast epiblast come here those epiblast that was lining this this cavity they differentiate into flattened cells and they are now called amnioblast now there is some controversy here among the authors some people believe that these embryo amnioblast they are not derived from the epiblast but they are derived from cytotrophoblast right so that is important to mention here and rest of the structures you already know now the this embryo would be quite happy that it has got two separate cavities now my question here is that why it is surrounded by these water bodies by these cavities all around right this epiblast it is also surrounded by this cavity called amniotic cavity and this uh, hypoblast it is surrounded by the cavity that has got several different names <laughs> i'm not gonna repeat those names but the question is why it is happening the reason is that a human it is about 60 to 70 percent made up of water right and humans they cannot tolerate dry environment even their embryo cannot tolerate dry environment water has the this fluid these two fluids they have several different functions uh, this yolk sac main function of this yolk, yolk sac is to provide nutrition and even though this amniotic fluid it also contains nutritious substances for example glucose and fat but its major function is to act as shock absorber some role is uh, some nutrition is provided by amniotic cavity as well but its major function is to act as shock absorber but besides that these two water bodies they have another important function one of the function is that they prevent desiccance or dryness of the embryo the other important thing is that these cells i mean these epiblast they need slightly different environment to flourish to grow and to proliferate and these hypoblasts they need a slightly different chemical makeup they need a slightly different environment with slightly different chemical makeup to maintain themselves to proliferate to grow right so chemical constituents of amniotic cavity will be of course different from the chemical chemical constituents of the exosilomic cavity it may contain some growth factors that are required for growing of epiblast and it may contain some growth factors that are required for growth and proliferation of hypoblast right besides that these amnioblast and this user's membrane they also produce certain chemicals they have endocrine functions as well they produce certain chemicals that are required during the process of <clears throat> during the embryogenesis right